right. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us here today. Um, Friday, TGIF, um, I guess. So I think I look more forward to the weeks than the weekends these days. Um, but uh, looking, looking forward to our presentation today. We're going to be talking kind of all things um, ultrasound, remote monitoring, online systems, um, permanent sensors, all that kind of stuff. So really excited. Got some new products to share. So um, looking forward to getting to unveil some of that fun stuff for you guys today. Um, just a couple couple things before we get started. Um, some of you are hearing this over and over and over again, but I, I guess we probably can't say it enough. But during this time, um, just want to be sure you guys know that, you know, us at UE Systems, we're, we're all kind of here to, to support you guys. Um, if, if you need some help on software or if you've got questions or issues, things that you, you need a little extra help working on, we've got our trainers available to do go-to meetings with you, um, our regional guys that, that you all know and work with, um, they're available and, and happy to hop on conference calls or WebEx or, you know, Zooms, whatever you guys want to do. Um, but just kind of keep that in mind and, and don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we, we definitely want to be that, that support for you guys during this time. Um, and to that end, also, we are <clears throat> kind of partnering up a little bit with um, our friends over at Iridicio. Um, so they've got some additional um, opportunities for some kind of no-cost um, short-term projects, the projects that they can help you with, templates they can give you, um, no-cost coaching hours. So that's a huge benefit. So if there's a project you're trying to get up and running during this time, um, definitely take advantage of that. They're also archiving all of these webinars that we've been doing um, as we do record them on their website, help.iridicio.com. Of course, you can also find them on our YouTube channel um, and on our website as well. So just kind of a myriad of opportunities for you guys to, to take advantage of maybe some downtime during, during this COVID-19 um, experience that we're all going through. Um, so just, you know, there's additional resources there for you. Um, again, as I said, we are recording this, so I'll have it up on our website and on YouTube, um, hopefully later today. So if you need to hop off or if you want to share it with a colleague, um, you'll have that opportunity to do so. We definitely welcome questions throughout. I'll be keeping an eye on those, and I'll get those tossed over to Blair and Gary um, as it makes sense to get clarification on something. Um, or, of course, we'll also do some Q&A at the end. Um, and any questions we don't get to, um, just know that we'll we'll follow up with you guys offline. So so don't worry about that. And um, just you know, a little my little caveat I say every time, just ignore any kind of obnoxious sounds you might hear. I, I can't do anything about them because they're all stuck here at home with me. So um, anyway, just bear with us, and hopefully we won't have any issues. Um, with that said, I am going to turn the screen over to Blair, and Blair um, and Gary will let you guys take it away. Yeah, thank you, Maureen. Let me just share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Just want to confirm. Yep, yep sure. looks great. Great, great. Well, yeah, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Maureen, for, for hosting me. Um, this is Blair Fraser, a co-founder of Cortec.ai. I've been working with uh, UE Systems on uh, some of the approach to this um, remote monitoring and, and, and sensing uh, capabilities. Um, and I'm going to speak a lot about, from my perspective, of um, data. Obviously, being a co-founder of an AI company, I, I, I speak uh, of the importance of, of data but how we generate that data and what we start to do with it. So I'm going to talk a lot about out outcomes of these products and what we can do with them and where I think they fit in. So when we look at the, the online and remote uh, capabilities that UE system has to offer, the way I look at it is I put it into two categories. And it's not that one category is better than the other. It's just really to what serves the, the purpose you're trying to solve or the problem you're trying to solve. And the way I look at the world, there are analog solutions and there are digital solutions. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that digital solutions are better. They just do certain things different. So when I look at the analog solutions that uh, UE Systems has to offer, um, those are the 750, the UltraTrack 750. You might have seen this before. It's, it's not any means a new product, but it has been revamped into a specific new product to solve a specific problem. And we call that the bearing condition and lubrication transmitter. The second one is the OnTrack. 
um, which we're going to dive more into that. It is an analog system that then converts into digital if you want to start moving data, but essentially leverages the power of the 750 into a turnkey solution. We then have the electrical cabinet monitor, again, an analog solution, and then we start to get into the digital solutions, the forecast and the foresight that Gary will go through. So let's start at the UltraTrack 750. It's it's the way I look at it and the way I have used the UltraTrack 750 before, specifically in data analytics problems, I have used it on a wide variety of applications because ultrasound, the acoustic level can do a lot, specifically when you're analyzing a vast amount of data. If you've ever seen, uh, I did a, a webinar for UE Systems, how I use the ultrasound and artificial intelligence to detect um, diaphragm valve leakage in a pharmaceutical application and things like that. But when we look at it specifically for the application that's most commonly used for, it's to detect the condition of a bearing and help with the lubrication of that bearing. So we strictly look at it just for that application. We can really fine tune what the solution is and how do we utilize that output. So to me, it provides four main features. First of all, the, the benefits that hopefully everyone on this call understands of ultrasound and where it fits on that P to F curve, particularly for bearings or rotating equipment. Um, what I like about it from a data point of view is it provides one simple overall value. You know, we're not going to hear the debate, you know, that vibration can do that, but it's really a high featured single value that's perfect for trending and alarming. So if you have applications where you just wanna know, is the bearing good or bad? Do I need to lubricate yes or no? So we get into those discrete decisions. You don't care if it's an inner race de defect, outer race defect, those type of things. The 750 is a very economical solution to, to add to those bearings. Um, so one sensor obviously uh, covers an entire bearing. We don't we we'll have to worry about different axes and things like that. So it really limits and provides that value of that one um, decibel reading coming out of it. And the third, it's a loop power transmitter. So really what we're dealing with is two wires. Um, and really what it's designed for, for any automation or control people that might be listening, or if you work with one, is you can easily add this transmitter to your existing PLC, DCS, um, SCADA system, whatever you're dealing with, depending on that industry to your existing infrastructure. So all you're really dealing with is a new transmitter, just like you would a pressure tang transmitter, uh, um, level transmitter, anything like that. It's the exact same thing. Um, so it provides you a real-time decibel reading to that, that host system. And then obviously it detects me mechanical faults and, and lack of lubrication. And, and I think most importantly too, as well as the over lubrication. So it's giving you that guidance to help that bearing before you actually start to um, get into the condition monitoring of that bearing. So when we look at wiring this, um, you know, it, a lot of you people are probably, you know, condition monitoring um, people and, and might not work in the PLC world that I came in. So the way I look at it is you have these assets, you're going to wire this transmitter to it. And truly it, it's, it, we, we use the word transmitter in the, in the automation industry, because that's essentially what it is. It, it's collecting it and transmitting it out. Um, but really what it's, that unit itself is three components in one stainless steel housing. So it has your ultrasound sensor in it, it has your transducer, and it has your transmitter in it. So it's taking that sensing, it's, tasting, it's, it's reading that uh, acoustic value, it's transforming it into a linear analog signal output, four to 20 milliamps. Four milliamps is, is zero, 20 milliamps is 40 and 12 milliamps, halfway in between is, is 20 decibels, right? So as I said, it makes a very easy way to trend that data. And we look at it, we have pre-wired the wires to it, uh, the cables. Um, so everything is sealed. So this thing is water resistance, dust proof, NEMA 4X, exceeds IP64 ratings, which essentially say you can, there are very few applications where you couldn't put this um, sensor or transmitter in, um, you know, hit it with a fire hose, do what you got to do, Northern Canada, that's fine, right? <laughs> Those are the applications it can go to. And simply running that back to your PLC, if anyone's ever ran, or hooked up analog instruments, you know, typically you can home run it with um, multi-core cable, um, 22 gauge, 18 gauge, somewhere in between there of seal twisted pair is really what you need if you have to go longer than the cable lengths that are, that are in there. Um, so one of the great features where I see the UltraTrack 750 transmitter really, really falling in is 
you know, obviously you can add it to your existing infrastructure. So if, if you have spare analog inputs available on a PLC that's controlling this piece of equipment, or you can add another card, an analog input card to that PLC, then it makes it very easy to, to bring in the ultrasound value into your existing systems. Now we're gonna address what happens if you don't have um, available room or for regulatory reasons you can't add new devices and things like that. And that's fine, we have a solution to meet that. But one of the things is when you're bringing in this analog input, I think above all than any other variable um, that's out there from a condition monitoring of a bearing point of view, ultrasound or decibel readings is very easy and insightful um, just on its own. So when we look at that, and this is the same that UE Systems is going to preach with their their rope based, their ultra probe units, is when you, you install this sensor and literally if you can glue something together and create a few if rules, then you have a complete monitoring solution in place. So once you've attached that sensor um, to that rotating piece of equipment and you begin to look at the baseline of how what uh, decibel readings that that bearing is running at, you can create some very uh, easy thresholds on top of that. So if you have eight decibels above that baseline, assuming it's a healthy bearing, um, indicates a lack of lubrication. 16 decibels indicates damage to the bearing um, beyond just a lubrication issue and 35 starts to say, hey, this thing's probably gonna walk down the hallway, you need to do something about it, right? Now these aren't set in stone, but these are some guidance um, to, to help you, right? So a simple automation person, you can say, wire this up, just create these three rules. If, if you see a, a, an eight a decibel increase over this baseline, just send an alert saying, check out this, it probably needs lubrication, right? So it makes it very simple for the non-condition monitoring people out there to be able to program this in and take actionable insights versus saying, okay, well, this moved up this this many decibels or, or this many value, we should do this, right? So it makes it very easy for, for that. Um, as I said, it's a, it's a sensor and transmitter all in one. What does it do? It obviously, again, if you look at the PDF curve where ultrasound fits in that PDF curve, right? It provides the earliest warning of bearing failures, detects lack of lubrication. And I think from my background in industry, prevents over lubrication, um, which is probably the, can do more damage in my opinion than lack of lubrication. And it finds defects not found in time-based lubrication. So we look at the sensor, the sensor can output that decibel readings as fast as the host system, that PLC, that DCS, that SCADA system is asking for it, right? You look at most PLC systems, we can get into um, microseconds, if not just seconds, right? Not that you need that kind of speed for this application, but that's, you know, typically every minute I would say would be more than enough, but we are sending this data in real time out of this transmitter. So if you're looking for an easy and economical way to be able to add bearing condition and lubrication monitoring equipment. I feel from an automation background, this is a very strong use case for this and how simple it can be, again, if you have the availability in your in your DCS or your PLC to be able to add that. If you can terminate, if you can glue something on something and you can terminate two wires, then you've got a pretty good chance of, of creating a successful solution using the UltraTrack 750. So what's happened is a lot of customers have come to UE Systems and come and said, you know, that's great, um, but I have a mass quantity of, of bearings in one location that I could benefit from just a, a overview from that single decibel reading, as I was saying, to monitor the equipment. I just don't necessarily want to get into, I don't want to look at FFTs or waveforms, right? I just want to give an overall indication, if you will, of how that's looking. So what UA System has come up with, and I give my input in, is, is let's create a turnkey solution to be able to have a solution out there that's going to see the benefits of those 750s, the UltraTrack 750s wired into a turnkey package that gives you um, remote access to it, that gives you trending capabilities so that you don't necessarily have to go and um, scale up your PLC systems or, or things like that if you have mass quantities of these, sent or of these bearings you want to start to monitor. Um, so I said, it's powered by the UltraTrack 750, designed to provide the earliest warning signs of machine failure with simplicity and scale in mind, right? So very sim simplistic alerts, likely that this bearing needs lubrication, likely that this bearing is entering into early fall stage, likely that this is entering into catastrophic failure, and also scalability in mind. And I'm going to talk a lot about this because in the space I'm in, specifically on the data side of things, we get into what's now being called um, pilot purgatory right where we have these pilot projects but we we have trouble seeing them scale from a pilot to real implementation across a plant or enterprise so we've designed this system to be able to scale 
So scale from one sensor to literally unlimited, but um, you know you start to get aspects of economies of scale as you add more sensors. But really, as you start to add these units, you can scale up what we call these remote units to cover an entire plant. Um, so you start to see similar applications, um, you know, standard um, ultrasound applications around um, bearing condition monitoring, steam trap, valve testing. And again, I've been uh, very creative how I've used these sensors on top of analytical engines to, to diagnose even some um, very rare use cases that are out there, but the, the capability is there within the system. So when we look at this, what are some of the, the, the features of the OnTrack? Um, so we built this system, first of all, for mobile view. We understand that everyone's mobile and most of us are listening to this webinar sitting at home. So wouldn't it be nice if we could um, tell how the condition of our bearing or if any of our bearings need lubrication while we're sitting on our butts at home, right? So everything is set up to be mobile. Um, that means um, how you want to imp how you want to network that device. If you don't want data leaving your four walls of your plant, that's fine. You need to be connected on your own aerial network. We can send data to the cloud, um, cellular network connections. There's a lot of options that are out there. And of course, since I had my input on this, I'm thinking about data and the use of this ultrasound decibel reading, which I think is going to be one of the richest sources of data for what's being called predictive maintenance um, or prescriptive maintenance in the future. And I think ultrasound is going to play a big role in that. The system was designed so that we could easily get data out of it. Now, um, I don't want to get into too much difficulty here but opc ua mqtt protocols like that are available and innate in this system so we can start and and, and what rest apis i might be losing some people on that but really what the takeaway from that is is that we can get data out of the systems so if you have an osi pi if you want to write work orders into maximo sap things like that if my decibel ring gets above a certain level i don't want an alert i want the planners and schedules to know and a, and a work order to pop up right that can easily be configured on our end to supply that data to those systems um, modular systems so the whole system can scale up from one to, to over 300 um, sensors just in the one base unit and of course alarming and events that you know it's really a, a a a push messaging you don't have to sit there and stare at a screen all the time you can totally ignore it and just gets alerts when something needs attention so the way it works is when we look at this the um online monitoring network is we have a base unit. Really, that's what's housing the, the horsepower of the engine, the compute, how you access that data, how you store data. It has built-in storage. Um, from our testing, we easily stored over well over five years worth of data of taking a reading um, every, uh, every uh, 30 seconds. So um, there's no issue in terms of, of storing that data to make sure you have a good baseline and good trend. Um, but you, know, you might have this high concentration of bearings you want to monitor overall in one location but down a hallway or the next room over or a drive down your plant you have a bunch of other units you want to measure you don't want to repeat that same horsepower that same capability is we have remote units and the modular up to 24 sensors that network together either by a vpn uh, or, sorry a virtual lan or ethernet together and they connect back to that base unit and that base unit becomes that home run that central spot so when you're looking at um dashboards, you're looking at trends, you don't have to log into different units to be able to get that kind of information. So you can start to see how we're addressing the, the scalability, as I said, from, from one sensor, though no one's ever started with one sensor, you'd probably start with a dozen or so, right? And be able to build a system that you put in place from day one that innately has the ability to scale as you can scale um, this project. So on track features, we've already talked about, and I probably beat it to, uh, to death here, about the modular and scalable. Um, the second one is IoT system ready. I've talked about like that, is the ability to move that data, to move that data into other, other platforms. I'm a big believer in combining this type of technology of ultrasound readings with process data, with machine history and things like that. So again, the system has been built. Um, to be able to get information out. And that's really what you need to know. If, if you do want to go down this path and, and you're worried about you know, talking to your IT folks, um, really all the security and platform abilities of moving that data. If you go to your IT system and say, hey, I want to get data out of the system into our OSI Pi, then we're going to go, oh no, or into some homegrown systems. You just say, hey, listen, they have MQTT or RESTful API built in. Your IT person is going to go, hallelujah, that's amazing, right? Um, 
remote monitoring, trending, and visualization, we understand that everyone's mobile. Uh, so really the capabilities of the system is how mobile you want to make it. As I said, you can leave it in your plant walls. So you have to be you know, connected to your 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 corporate or, or your own plant land in order to get this information. Or you can you can go through firewalls and get it out there and be able to visualize it while you're while you're sitting at home. Um, and number four, own your data. A big component of this, um, everything we do is again, this is your data. Um, you can export it, you can save it to an SD drive, do whatever you do, but really it's designed so that all the data, we, we are not in the data um, storage business. Um, so it's really meant for, for you to own that data and you own it for your, your life, right? So if you want to take that data, export it to Excel, start doing things, send it to other plants, there's, there's no reason why you can't do that because the, the data literally resides on your premises. The, the other um, one I want to talk about is another analog device, and it's very similar to the Ultratrack 750, where the Ultratrack 750 really its primary purpose is around bearing condition and lubrication monitoring. The ECM 586 is another analog device, so the same wiring, the same analog signal that comes from um, the 750 is now put in place to monitor the airborne uh, ultrasound for electrical cabinet monitoring. Um, so you start to see some application pictures. It's designed to mount inside a cabinet, and what it's doing is it's listening. It's listening for arcing, tracking, corona, 24/7, and it's giving you that ability to set those alarm thresholds um, on that signal, so to detect those issues before it becomes a big problem. And what you do with this piece of equipment is do the exact same thing that we're talking about with the 750. Now we do a package that comes in complete, um, but there's no reason why you couldn't take this device and easily add it to your existing PLC, the existing control system or monitoring system that might be monitoring um, switch gear, those cabinets already. So very functional device that's out there, um, same as a 750, but for electrical cabinet monitoring. Gary, I am going to pass this over to you. Oh, very good. Thanks, Blair. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Oh. Uh, you ended sorry. the presentation, Blair. There no, you go. Sorry. I hit, I hit the wrong button. That was a okay. uh, error by me. <laughs> Fair enough. So thanks, guys. Uh, I'm uh, Gary Moore, and so thank you, Blair. It's a pretty tough act to follow. I'll do my best here. Uh, so I'm going to hey, take over. You know over... what, Gary? Sorry. Yes. Can I can I just jump in because there was a question specific to what Blair was just talking about. Sure. That maybe Pretty makes lot. sense to to hit real quick. So someone was asking if any third party sensor with a four to twenty milliamp output could be connected to the on track system. Very good question. You know what? I had that slide and I thought it might be confusing. So absolutely, any. Um, any four to 20 uh, milliamp device, whether it's loop powered or self powered, um, can be added to that. And we've seen that before where people want to add a pressure sensor or a temperature sensor and things like that for to the on track. Um, absolutely, it can be done. Very good. Thank you, Blair. Very good. So now let's go uh, on. We'll move forward on to what we call maybe the digital units and the ones with the analyzers involved. But it kind of makes sense from my point of view, like, how do we get there and, you know, where are we now? So, as a lot of you know, we've been doing data collection with handheld instruments for quite some time. You know, we started back with our just our troubleshooters, moved them into the digitals where we were collecting decibel readings and storing that over time. And then we moved on to ones that actually collect store DB reading and we can record the sound. So, we do continuous monitoring with permanent sensors or we can do a combination of both, some handheld and some permanent in a mixed environment. Can you move me there, Blair? Blair? Yeah, did it go? Yeah, nope, not yet. There it went. So, Hold on, let me go back. <laughs> oh, uh, your screen, I think we're uh, just in a little delay there, right? Okay. Now go forward. So these handheld data collection devices, a lot, many of you know, the Ultra Pro 15 or the Ultra Pro 10,000, we take them out and do our root base. And the UP401, uh, which is our digital grease caddy, uh, same sort of thing, except we mount them a grease gun. Now we use either of these or any of our digital tools really with what we call a remote access sensor. And we have these in several different uh, configurations where the uh, contact one that we'd use for bearing monitoring, the magnetic mounted ones that we use very often on our uh, portable equipment, and then we have airborne ones as well. 
So what we do with those devices on the RAS sensors, we connect those to some source of ultrasound, usually like something like a pump and a motor. And then we bring those back and we can read those with this ultra probe. We store it up here on this uh, scan disk, so the thing plugs in the side of it, bring that back to our computer, plug it in, and the computer then stores this data. We get our, all of our history on there. It lets us trend this information. We can see charts. We can then take the sound files we collected, do an FFT, or do a time series over here. And this has all been great, right? It really has been working out very well. Those RAS sensors, we can connect directly to them or we connect up to a switch box. We'd run the BNC cables back to a nice clean setup on the switch box. And that's been extremely successful from a safety point of view, from an access point of view. And just time, how much time it takes to take readings is a lot faster when we had it all hooked up from a switch box. But then building onto that system, we move that over and connect those sensors to a forecast box. So what is a forecast and what does it do? Well, what it really does is it constantly listens and monitors those bearings just 24 seven, always monitoring. So you get to set up in there where you want it to alarm. And if it does get something out, it immediately can send you an email or text, both. It can also, in addition to just alarm, and you can store readings right on board, right at the box itself, at any predetermined levels that you wanted or condition-based levels you wanted. And then we can also send some of those readings or all those readings back to the DMS for permanent historical records. So you want to keep them even longer. So how's that, what that, what's that look like when you put in a system? Much like the other ones, you take those RAS sensors already installed, wire them up to your forecast, hook the power up to it. Now the data can come either through an ethernet connection here, or we can put a Wi-Fi router up on there and let your computer discover it. It'll collect that data. We can again, historically trend it. We can look at that through a chart or we can grab the sound files and do our analytics on it as well as the time series. That's been one of the real uh, big powerful things about that forecast, the ability to do all those things. So, so now what do we do with the what do we do with the foresight? So we've got this other product we call the Foresight. Now it looks very much like the forecast, but instead of it's it's different internally slightly, we listen at a different frequency to optimize it for elect electrical applications. And rather than attaching contact sensors to a bearing source, we have airborne sensors that we would mount inside of electrical gear. Those actually come back, route back into the forecast. We take the data into our computer. We can trend those readings and we can grab those sound files. And as anybody that's done electrical inspections know, those sound files are key for electricity. So that is what we call the foresight. So let's look at it. What does it actually look like? Let's look at the actual results, if you will. So we capture DB readings. We can look at them live. If it exceeds an alarm, we'll see that it kind of turns it red. We have many control things we can set up on side of this, but I want to get too deeply into the control side of the uh, forecast. Let's look at the results. What are we going to get from this thing? So here's what you get. First thing is we can set up alarms. So as soon as you will exceed something, we can send you a text message. We can send you an email. Now, the really cool thing about these emails that you can send out, they'll give you the uh, alarm, the date, the time, what state, or baseline, but it can also embed the sound file itself. So you can go listen to that bearing from your cell phone when you're not at the plant. Say, what's it sound like? And you can go listen to it. Test message, same way. It can send it over to you. It'll give you all the details about that. And it's it, it's like, um, you don't need to be looking at things that haven't indicated that there's any sort of problem in, at the moment. So then in the end, what we end up with is a database of historical readings. We can chart, plot that over time. We can see our, uh, you know, our XY plots and see where the trends lead us to it. And very often in bearings, as you monitor them over time, you'll see your loop points. And you'll see how often it went into a loop alarm and how often you regreased it. And as that bearing starts to degrade in condition, even though you don't have defects that may need lubrication a little more frequently, you can start to see the what's driving the history of it. Maybe you'll see what's driving you into alarm is when they are greasing them on their time base. And they're the ones driving into alarm if you're actually over lubricating it. 
So you build this historical tree with those DB readings, but in our DMS software, we can actually attach the sound files to those different points. And so simply by clicking on our link down in the software to open up the spectrum analyzing software, it will pull the spectrum analyzing software up and bring up the correct sound file uh, associated with that date. And then we can go do analysis on that actual reading, whether it be electrical or barren. So here, when we're analyzing the sound, this launched it, brought it up. We just hit run. It draws a spectrum here. And here we can see we're looking at what I believe is an out, outer bearing race defect. Shows up in the harmonics. We can put harmonic cursors on this. We can put our quick calculator on it on the right to make sure it is what we think it is. So there's lots of things you can do with that sound. You can keep replaying it, rerun it. You can actually, as well, hold this as an overlay, go bring up the baseline sound file and play it underneath bring up one for maybe six months in between, play it in between, and create that all on top of each other. So then one of the things built into this DMS that people really love, and I tell you this has been great, is we have these reports we can pull out. It'll pull the picture from the chart if you want, or it could be a photograph of the image. Over here is uh, the sound file spectrum that we did. It'll let you put in comments, and you can actually link the baseline sound file, what it sounded like when it was okay, and you can bring the current sound file and you can send that to somebody. So one of the things that we see happening quite a bit is when there's a machine or piece of electrical gear that has an issue at the moment or it's got an indication that it needs some inspection, it's not a single person's decision. So it's nice to wrap that all up in a nice little report, let everybody look at it and listen to it at their own will and then see and make a collaborated decision, if you will. Here's what we need to do next. So on this airborne electrical system, on this foresight, we'll actually go use that sound file to really determine severity. So we heard a noise inside. What does it mean? Well, we can go look at these uh, the time in these uneven bands and the spaces between those. And we've got a bunch of samples you can go compare and look at those against and say, this is a real indication of tracking. We need to get some instant uh, attention to this piece of gear before it becomes worse and gets into actually arcing. So we can tell that by looking at this frequency content in these sound files, and we can kind of teach you how to look at those too, or you can go look at our, our uh, sample databases that we have for it, and you'll find that it's not as difficult as, as it may appear to be right at first. So the big question is, that's our digital things, Why? Ultrasound is probably the, I guess, obvious question, if you will. But I have always said that I think the overall level in ultrasound is one of the great leading indicators. So in a bearing, the first overall level you're going to get as it increases in frictions, you're going to get a rise in that decibel level. In electricity, the electrical gear is normally quiet. So as soon as you get a sound, something's causing that sound. Let's take a look at why. The ultrasound works on an extremely wide range of applications that can be difficult for other technologies. So, you know, things like slow speed bearings, uh, complex gearboxes, things along this line, we can actually use the sound really successfully in those cases. Then what we can do is take that overall level and we can spend really time looking at that spectrum and the time data or the uh, FFT and dig into the details when it's really needed. So like, you know, for years and years, I've been going to these different uh, conferences and I, it just always amazed me at the different vibration presentations where you hear people show slides and examples about defects that they missed. Well, I think it's very difficult to do a really an awful lot of analysis on something where there's not an indication that something may be wrong. So this gives you that ability to really look in great detail into a piece of machinery once you know that it's shown something. And then of course, we can give you an analog solution to tie into yours, or we can give you a, a analog solution that we can give you a complete solution to, or a digital one where we can also bring in the FFTs and analysis with it as well. Why the forecast? Well, I'd say one of the big things is we get the heavy data storage on board the system itself rather than tying up bandwidth over your network or back on your computers. So you can set up how much you want to keep on board and have it roll, kind of like 
think of a security camera looking outside of the grocery store. You know, you can keep 30 days of rolling information in there, 60, 90, and just let it overwrite itself when it gets old and you don't need it. It uh, leverages up existing Ethernet networks or existing Ethernet uh, wireless hubs. You can put this thing in, in a real small scale to test, or maybe that's even all you need. If you just have one critical gearbox in your place, you can put in four points on the thing or six or eight or whatever it needs, and it's actually fine to do it in a very small scale. You can easily expand that. So if you need to build out a system slowly over time, you can do that really simply with this forecast. It also uses existing RAS sensors that so many of you already have in place. Um, easy enough to do that. Why the foresight? Well, this continually listens to electrical issues you may have in electrical gear. And as um, we hear from our customers, and we know electrical failures are kind of the worst kind you could possibly have, so they can have such big consequences. It again uses the same Ethernet network that you already have available to you. We can hook those up to a wireless router. They expand easily as well, but it records these sound files when it hears something. And the sound file is what you really need to gauge severity going on in that piece of electrical gear. It'll let you really sort out, do I need to do something now? Can we wait a while? Let's keep an eye on it. It'll tell you what to do. So Blair, that's what I have. Um, Thanks for everybody listening to me, Blair. You, I think I'll let you close it up for us, us here. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll 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 hit this slide and then we'll we'll open it up. Hopefully, there's some questions uh, that we can we can walk through. I can think of uh, some that uh, you should be should be asking in particular. But uh, yeah, so the way I look at it, there's a there's a wide range of solutions. Um, and again, um, you know, starting starting small. Um, the way I've always said it is, you know, think big, start small, scale fast. Right, keeping those those three um, actions in mind, um, you know, I, I'd recommend if if anything is of interest to you um, in in the in these applications, um, there's not a one size fits all. You know, if you have this, then do this. Um, it really depends on um, how critical your assets are. Do you want to be able to do advanced diagnostics? Do you have existing infrastructure in place? There's a lot of um, you know, you know, questions uh, to ask before you go down a certain path of, of which application makes sense for you. Um, and I invite anybody that wants to do that to to, to either give us a shout or, or call and uh, go from there. Perfect, uh, Blair. I would say that anybody that would like us to get on their computer and take a look at your actual um, situation with you and help us uh, give you a roadmap or to start a pilot, we would love to do that. We we have always before, during, and after this, we've always loved talking to our customers. So any kind of issues that you have that come up to mind, we, we uh, really do enjoy talking yeah. to you guys about those things. Or even just a chat. I'm getting lonely. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. Turn to the same screen, maybe you can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Maureen, do we have anybody right. with some questions you'd like to shoot us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. We do. So let me try and kind of work my way through these. Um, have had several people um, kind of chime in or ask um, about slow speed bearings and what what's a good solution for those. Are any of these solutions good for slow speed? And then also, as you're answering that, um, some questions around kind of how do you define slow speed? So as it relates to you know what your answer is going to be. So maybe you guys can tackle that to start. Blair, can I take the slow speed bearings? I I, I love this Absolutely. one. Absolutely, take it. I give you the baton. Well, so I can tell you, slow speed uh, can be any RPM you want it to be. But I think very often you hear a couple earmarks from uh, vibration folks that when you start talking about under 600, and then sometimes again under 200 RPM. But really, from an ultrasound point of view, we don't monitor the displacement in those bearings so we don't need that kind of inertial speed to give us those like a car running over a pothole where you can get that thump it has to be going a, a good enough speed we actually monitor the amount of friction in that bearing is what causes that so for us very slow speed is fine what we do need on a slow speed bearing is a little bit of load but even in fractional rpm if you've got a bearing running on a load that load is what's causing that friction in that bearing. So if you really think about a bearing is designed to take one moving object and you know displace that, hold it in place from the outer piece that's not moving, 
and the ball bearings are in there to facilitate that. The lubrication is in there to actually make up for the little imperfections that you have during manufacturing to get rid of the friction if it was just scraping in there. So it's all designed about reducing friction. And what we do is monitor the amount of friction. So we'll tell you about the bearing and then you'll, it'll tell you about the lubrication in that bearing. And the RPM of that thing being really slow is not a problem for it, especially with really heavy loads. It really doesn't matter at all. We're just giving you the amount of friction that's in that bearing. That answer that you think? So if it didn't, if folks still want a little clarification, just just write that in. Um, get that these get a little hard to keep track of here. Um, okay, so on to um, another kind of common theme on some of these questions is kind of in regards to existing CMMS platforms that folks are working in. Um, you know, I'm seeing Maximo mentioned or asked, I'm seeing Oracle. Um, so how do any of our solutions here interact with or do they with any of the the CMMS um, systems that folks have um, as far as maybe you know automatic work orders being generated things like that maybe you guys can touch on that I'll take that one Gary yep works yeah. for me. so I, I think whether you know I each CMMS is a, is a little bit different and and there you know there's there's some great new companies out there that are offering CMMS or ERP systems um, each one is a little bit different um, but um, essentially on the database side of things, whether it's from the OnTrack or DMS, um, what we're talking about is moving data. So we've designed the systems to be able to move that data easily. Now, what we find is, for example, to write a, um, a work notification um, into SAP. It really depends on the micro version of SAP you're using on how that gets done, right? Um, it, it Maximum is, in my opinion, a little bit easier to to, to get that connection done, um, but it's not it's not um, it's not a solution out of the box. We say this is this is my auto work order creation from from UE Systems to to Maximo. Um, there's a little bit of work on you know specifically what information, what tag it's written over, and things like that that can customize. But the answer is yes, it can easily be done. The only challenge I would put out there is not to create the work orders automatically right away. Make sure you have a good baseline, making sure you're not creating work orders because the majority of, of, of us, and I'll generalize, you know, we already have a backlog um, of, of, of work orders and auto generating one might not be the best solution, but if you are in a place to do it, absolutely, it can be done from, from any of these systems. All right, um, another one that I'm seeing pop up a few times, um, temperature issues with the sensors, so this, um, so I guess even with the 750, with the RAS um, for both forecast, foresight, what, what's our temperature? Um, I'll, I'll take that one, Blair. Yep. So we have several different options for temperatures. For one, um, we can build higher temp sensors. In some cases, that'll do it alone all by itself where we can actually have the temperatures that they'll withstand higher. And then if we get beyond that, we didn't put it on this uh, presentation, but we have this isolation yoke is what we call it. And it's a little bit like, uh, it's a tube with a fin radiator on it sort of thing. It's a, It looks, it's about three inches long or so. And you, you thread it onto the mountain and thread the sensor onto this, and you can reduce your surface temperature from what you're attaching the sensor to, to about from like 300 degrees. So we've used that in things like steam traps where we bring it down quite a, quite a ways. We haven't run into a temperature situation we're not able to handle. All right. Um, okay, now back to um, the um, on track. So a question has come in about, um, hold on a second, let me just scroll up to it here. Um, hold on, hold on. They're, they're still coming in, so it keeps getting me off my, <laughs> it keeps messing up my scrolling here. Um, shoot. This is more intention than I've gotten in like in months. I, I know, I know. Um, okay, so then, so, and while I try and find that one, another question kind of talking about, someone was trying to figure out, you know, which way do they go? Do they start with on track and, and go that route? Do they go forecast? Can they start with one and then move to another? Kind of what's 
is that more just kind of a case by case basis and something that would be worth then hopping on a call to really determine the needs? Or how do you see the two or three or whatever um, different products kind of working with each other or are they just completely separate? Um, well, I'll ask Blair to weigh in on this as well, but I'll give you my thoughts on it. I think this um, on track is ideally suited for high concentrations of bearings where the economy of scale on that thing really starts to show off and you're able to do that. So you, it's not maybe not uh, all super critical assets where you can have that overall level is enough and we can really leverage up by putting high numbers into a concentrated home port where the forecast, you know, four by itself is still pretty efficient. So if you have a single piece of high valuable uh, gear or they're scattered long distance away from each other and you really need those sound analytics, that kind of starts to drive the difference between those. I would say on the foresight, you have that ECM that's gonna work good like in MCC centers where they maybe have a control system in place where they can get the overall level. But I think that in the foresight, when you got enclosed switch gear, you're gonna want access to that sound file any way you look at it, if you can get it. So I think the foresight's gonna probably be the answer in most cases in electrical. And I think in the uh, uh, on-track versus the forecast, it's gonna be based upon what your current criticality, uh, distance, concentration of assets, those sort of things that we'll look into. You have any yep, thoughts I, on that, Blair? No, I, I would echo just those those exact same comments. Okay. Um, then another one. Hold on. They're just I'm kind of falling in here a little bit, but a lot of the same the same ones. Um, oh, so for the forecast, how many <laughs> forecast units can you kind of have hooked up at one time? And is there a way to retrieve the data from that in a way other than with our software? So is there a way to export to like a CSV file or, or some other method to get that, retrieve that data? Well, we haven't, we, there isn't any limit to how many we can hit up. There might be a physical limit out there somewhere. We have never hit it. And I don't, so there isn't any physical limit on how many forecasts we can hook up to one system. Uh, it does require at least our software to initially grab the data from there. So uh, whether you had one running out there by itself and you hooked a computer up to it just to go grab those files when you needed, we've had some situations where that has happened. They weren't able to get it connected to a network because of whatever the issue may be. Uh, now, once it's in our system and once it's in there, it's completely an open architecture. You can move it anywhere you want after that point. All right, cool. Well, I think I think we got to most. Um, there's some, like I said, that um, are probably some questions better answered offline and kind of more specific to your particular needs. Um, so we'll we'll certainly be in touch. But as as they said when they were wrapping up, um, you know, if you want to hop on a kind of personal meeting with you know to discuss these options and, and what your particular application or, or situation is. Um, we welcome that and we encourage you guys to do that and to, again, take advantage. As Blair said, um, we're all tired of talking to the same people in our house. <laughs> so we're happy <laughs> to uh, spend time talking to uh, some fresh faces. Um, so please um, help us all out with that. Um, so awesome presentation, guys. I'm going to take the slides back here real quick and just kind of go through um, a couple closing slides here. Um, you know, as we're going to continue to to try and do as many of these webinars as we can. Uh, we know a lot of you guys are working from home, um, and so just trying to give you guys something to do again, even just to break up the the monotony of the day. Um, so next week on Thursday, we're going to have James Kovacevic from Iridicio. Um He presented last week on job plans. Um, he's going to come back and talk about. Um, the black hole of maintenance and your maintenance backlog, which is probably very um, important topic uh, at, at this moment for sure. Um, so if you 
have sat in on a presentation of James's before, you know he has uh, got tons of great information to share, um, great experience. So that should be a really good one. Um, and then on Friday, next Friday, May 1st, I cannot believe it's May already, um, we are going to hop back on and talk about uh, ultrasound assisted lubrication and our digital grease caddy. So again, if ultrasound is, is where you're at or where you're interested in, we're going to be back talking more about what, what, what we're good at. So, um, look for an invite to come from those. Um, and again, just a reminder, cause that people were asking, we were recording this, um, and we will for sure share any information that you guys want from, from these slides. Um, so just shoot us, um, an email, I've got our info email there, you've got my personal email. Um, just get in touch with us however you however you want and uh, we'll we'll get the information to you um, and share that out and we'll have this recording up online um, hopefully later today. Um, but uh, thanks again, Gary and Blair for the presentation. Thanks to everybody that joined us. Hope everybody has a great weekend. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll catch you guys later. Thanks, Maureen.